right, testing, testing. Just make sure I've got sound. It seems like I do. All right, good. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Future in Space Hangout series sponsored by the American Astronautical Society. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.com, and today we're going to be talking about cybersecurity in space. Now, recently, Emerging threats have increased the priority of space cybersecurity initiatives, including the recently enacted Fifth Space Policy Directive, which we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. Now, we people are starting to think about questions like, what are companies and governments doing to determine and implement best practices to ensure a secure space environment? And they also want to know, how can these entities address the diverse and growing list of threats, perceived or real? And what will it take to truly secure the space-centric environment? I mean, <laughs> if you think about it, could you imagine what would happen if our GPS system got hacked? I mean, GPS is involved in every aspect of our lives. And if someone with bad intentions got access to it, well, many, many aspects of our lives would be in serious trouble. And one of the things I started thinking about when I found out that this was going to be our topic for today, because, you know, I never think about this stuff, you know, I wondered... You know, how secure is the stuff that's been in space for a while? How secure is that stuff? I mean, we've got things like the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been up there for 30 years. And even though it was thoroughly upgraded in 2009 with the fifth servicing mission on the shuttle, I wondered if anything could happen to that thing. Well, luckily, there are people out there thinking about this stuff. And our guests today are specialists in the field. And I'll be introducing them here in just a minute. But first, let me say that the American Astronautical Society is sponsoring this content. And I want to let you know that you should become a member if you are interested in space, aeronautics, and astronautics, and all of that stuff about going into space, because they cover all of it. In fact, next month is the Von Braun Symposium, where there will be talks about the latest developments in space science. So you definitely want to check that out if you can. And you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description box below or go to astronautical.org slash membership or astronautical.org slash join. Okay, so let me go ahead and bring up my co my, my guests with me today. Let me bring up John. There they are. With me today is John Stouffer. He is the, he's the one in the lower uh, pane there. He's the senior fellow at the Prague Security Studies Institute. And uh, also with me is uh, Brandon Bailey. He is the cybersecurity senior project leader at the Aerospace Corporation. So welcome, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, I can. Well, I'm All right, good. Now, as we talked about before we started the, uh, the Hangout, um, let's start with you, John. Maybe give us a sort of just an intro into what the problems are that you're thinking about. What do we mean when we say cybersecurity in space and, and what are the problems that we're thinking about now? Right, Tony. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, the American Astronautical Society for the opportunity to join you today. Um, so uh, the problem that I see it is um, my, my background is, is more national security space as opposed to commercial or, or NASA. So the problem is I see it as in space um, is integrated into every part of our way of life. You mentioned GPS, and that, of course, brings up the obvious uh, knowing where we are and, and, and how we're going to get there using services like Uber. But GPS also provides the timing signal that the financial sector depends on so they can line up transactions and things like that. But space also provides the weather to predict disasters and support humanitarian assistance, things like that. It supports farming and energy um, and, and just a whole host of things. So it in essence, we've we've come to the point where our way of life is critically dependent on space systems. Now, unfortunately, the rest of the world recognizes that, and it provides them an asymmetric advantage uh, should they be able to deny us the use of the space systems. So, um, as time has gone on, the ability to get into the space systems has has been easier and easier insofar as um, some of the other threats are very, very difficult, like launching a, 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 a missile to hit uh, a satellite space is hard. But cyber provides what we call a, a, a gray zone opportunity where 
not only nation states, but other malicious people um, can actually fiddle in our systems and create problems that are beneath what we typically would consider an act of war. So um, that is that is where all of this is coming together. It's, it's a combination of the importance of all of the space systems and how much they're integrated into our life with the fact that they're they're vulnerable and that we have not really focused on hardening them uh, over the years and uh, the access that people get to them. So, so that is the main problem. And you mentioned uh, Space Policy Directive 5. That is a reflection now of the government's interest and commitment and their priority to start organizing the government and industry to work together to kind of shore things up. And I think we'll get into that uh, later, but that is the problem as I see it. It's, it's really a national security issue, one that affects everybody in, the, in, in certainly our country and across the globe. It certainly is. It seems to be getting more important as time goes on too. Okay. So uh, Brandon, you want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I echo everything John said there. There was, there was, I agree with everything. Just to enhance some of the things he was stating is one of the the value of space is is kind of well known at this point, but the the security of it is is less known. And with what we've seen and what I've seen in my experience is a lot of the the focus from a cybersecurity perspective has been on the ground segment and less on the actual kind of the space vehicle space craft side of it house. So uh, one of the great things with SPD-5 I felt that, that put in there was their definition of space systems. They included, you know, all the all the things that you would expect, the spacecraft itself, the comms links, the ground segments to include the industrial control system, support area, operational technology. So having that common taxonomy that we can now pull from and knowing that we need to secure it, I think is crucial. And the call to arms to secure uh, com- commercial areas, civil areas, uh, as well as national security space is, is huge. Now, I think I think cyber is kind of a great equalizer because like what John said, I mean, it's a little tougher to, to launch your own ASAP uh, weapon to destroy satellites, but cyber is an equalizer from that perspective is a lot of countries have already been um, using cyber means to do various various things for years. Using what? What'd you say? Cyber what? Using cyber via various means to... Oh, cyber via... Okay, okay. okay. Uh, and when you say cyber, I mean, that's just sort of... That's kind of like saying computer, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty... It's pretty yeah. over... Yeah. So what do you mean when you say cyber uh, specifically? So in the space context, I'm talking specifically using kind of just computers to issue um, offensive actions. So... That could be, you know, any type of uh, computing device or whereas typically what we've seen in the past when we talk about space security in that context is really geared around electronic warfare. So that would be, you know, uh, emitting RF signals and various jamming and spoofing attacks on, on space, whereas cyber is, you know, you can be anywhere in the world if you can achieve the, the right you know, network routes and paths. And, and if you have insiders it's even easier to, to get access to these, to these environments to do, to do the damage you're trying to do. So that's what I mean by cyber is, is initiating the, the attack vectors, ones and zeros from, from a cyber means, as opposed to, you know, a, a kinetic or, or a uh, some sort of weapon in space type of thing. Now I know in the course of this conversation, I'm going to ask you things you're going to probably tell me you can't answer because there was a lot of that when John and I talked last night a little bit on the phone and there's, there's a lot that is uh, you know, classified and can't be discussed and all of that. So, but it seems to me that is this, a this seems to me to be a pretty new thing for not just the governments, but also for companies that are building things to go into space. Have you guys only recently been, when I say you guys, I mean, government industry, Think tank people, all of that. People who think about space and 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 uh, and ground control systems. Um, are, is this a pretty new thing you guys have been thinking about, or have you been doing it since forever? Because to me, it seems pretty new. Well, from huh? you know, I'll start from from the department's point of view. It's it's not new, um, but I would describe this as a, a cat and mouse game, as our adversaries and and other people with uh, malicious intent get better, we have to get better. It is an evolving environment. Um, it's it's getting increasingly more challenging. And quite frankly, the consequences are much more uh, severe. 
uh, certainly yeah. now than than in the past, isn't that? I mean, absolutely. Really. And I would I would go so far as to say, in in the Department of Defense, I cannot think of a single weapon system or a single platform that does not depend on space. Um, there are, there are some that that might have alternatives, but um, but but virtually everything is now. Okay, we are not as sophisticated and insofar as the planning that we've done uh, leading up to this point. And I, and I think one of the things that SPD-5 opens up is that it direct, it, well, there's a lot of suggestive language in, S, in, in SPD-5, but, but one of the things that is important is that it really opens up the fact that the government should be considering security, cybersecurity practices uh, when they do things like source selections. I didn't use that specific language, but that's sort of the intent. So as the government starts uh, considering making awards to companies, they, they will probably start evaluating whether or not either companies that are going to build for defensive systems or commercial companies that want to sell to them, whether or not they have adequate security practices in place. And that starts from the beginning uh, all the right. way through their operations. So so I think uh, SPD-5 has been very good as kind of an, an introduction to state the government's commitment to how serious this is. There's still a lot of work that has to be done in terms of what they're going to do and how they're going to work with industry. But, but we are at the beginning of it. And this is a long game. This is not something that will be ever solved. It, it is just something that it, it will be constantly uh, an issue that has to be brought higher up in the priority of, of our policies. Okay, I want to get to that policy directive here in just a minute, but before I do, Brandon, I was going. I want to bring up something that was in one of your slides here. Uh, let me bring this up. Um, uh, there was um, in the introduction. There were you. And I think I've got the right slide up. Um, these. One of the reasons I think that we haven't really maybe thought about it before um, is because. Um, the, in that second bullet point there, it says the vulnerability of satellites and other space access assets to cyber attack are often overlooked in wider discussions. And part of the reason is that there has always been sort of this implied, um, this implied kind of uh, gap, air gap, if you want to use uh, security terms, you know, for, for this kind of stuff. Um, it wasn't easy to get at this stuff, right? We didn't, in the past, maybe in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever it was, we were launching things, building things. We didn't always um, uh, worry so much about it because there's kind of an implied barrier to entry, right, to getting into this stuff. But that's kind of changed, hasn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I call out, I think, in some of those slides that talk exactly that. The barrier to entry to space has been dramatically reduced with the commercialization of space and the and the maturation of small sats, cube sats, and things like that. So, you know, before you know, fifty years ago, you have to build your, basically build your own rocket, uh, build your own satellite, launch the thing, and get it in orbit. Now you can uh, lease uh, a, a ride on some sort of uh, launch service. You can use Amazon compute for your ground uh, compute. You can use Amazon ground station for your communication. So basically all you got to do is build a satellite for whatever the money is and you can leverage commercial, you know, that's why universities and, and all sorts of other people are launching, you know, CubeSats, one, two, three, U, small sats and CubeSats is because the barrier to entry is so, so low. And what that barrier, that lower and barrier entry has also done is it invited the community to get together and, and learn about space and do research and realize, you know, all these, it's not just kind of voodoo and magic. It's, it's not as complicated as everyone thinks. Which, which plays you know, right into the, the security by obscurity model no longer being really relevant, which kind of was in the early days, but now it's, it's not. Yeah, I mean, as you were talking there, I was reminded about the, talking about the barrier of entry being low is the, <laughs> there's a company called SpaceFab and they are an offshoot of uh, a good friend of mine's uh, company, OPT Telescopes and Dustin Gibson. They are building out of a CubeSat a space telescope upon which they plan to offer uh, to the general public, amateur astronomers, things like that. Uh, and they're doing it. I mean, it's not cheap, but it is certainly um, within the realm of private companies now who just have a decent idea to get in there. So, um, so the barrier to entry, 
to me, that's always an example of how how low it has been uh, uh, to get to space now because these these special interest companies are doing it. Although I do wonder a lot, they're going to allow people to. Like, it's, it's going to be an eight inch. Um, uh, I think it's going to be an eight inch RC telescope, and I think they're going to go be able to point it to Earth and uh, take. They, they one of the things you can do is take a space selfie, and I could just imagine all kinds of national security issues <laughs> related to that. So um, I'm not sure uh, if that'll work or not, but uh, that's one thing I learned about as far as that goes. All right, so the fifth space policy directive. Let's talk about that, John. What? What is it? I mean, we, we you 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 brought it up briefly, um, but this is is this a is this a document that is binding to the federal government? Is this something that it's a directive? So what does that mean? Uh, okay, so this is how the the administration formulates policy and then um, promulgates it. So this is the fifth one. Um, uh, the, I think the fourth one was the one that directed the department uh, to establish the space force. So. That's a, that's a big deal. The, I think it was the third one that uh, spoke to space traffic management. There's another one on um, on regulations that govern commercial space, things like that. So this is how the administration sets its policy and priorities and, and that sort of thing. So in that regard, uh, an SPD is a big deal. Um, now, having said that, this is such a complicated problem uh, that I would describe this policy as not being heavy on directives. The the clearest directive was that it directed the government to work with industry on helping establish uh, good good processes and, you know, hygiene, security, and all of that. Um, And and that's even kind of um, vague. So I think there's a lot insofar as what it is the government can provide to industry to help them out. One of the big issues that I think... we have to wrestle with this. Exactly what is the risk? How, 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 really, what is it? So a lot of that is in classified channels, and it'll present a problem with balancing how to help industry with preserving the ability of the government to, to kind of do its job, um, which will require not sharing everything. Um, so so I, I think in, in terms of the future, um, you know, the the and the SPD is is very good at opening up the the what I call the beginning dialogue. How is the government going to interact with industry? What is it that industry expects? And and what are the what are the mechanisms that will connect the two? I think there's a lot of work that has to be done there. I, I know that Department of Homeland Security is doing a review right now to identify what part of space is uh, has threads in other things that have been identified as part of our critical infrastructure. And there are some people that are are considering whether space ought to be its own category, even though parts of space are already embedded in other parts of, of the infrastructure. So so this is a big deal, but but I would say it's the first step in a big deal. What what will follow now from making this a priority and directing the federal government to work with industry and and start considering um, cybersecurity as, as part of its business is really the thing that, that now will, will, I think, get the, the ball rolling on this. So again, it's, it's not very heavy on directive policy, but it's big in terms of how expansive this is and how many people now have to start figuring out what, what the next steps are. Okay. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, recently, I did just this week, actually, a, a breakdown of SPD-5 and kind of what it means and trying to translate that to uh, to kind of what what implementation may look like or what is it really saying. And it if you bo- if you want to boil down SPD-5 in kind of one sentence, and my, my takeaway is what I got from it is it's, it's asking for a threat-informed risk-based engineering approach to developing space systems. I mean, that, that's really what it gets to. And that, and echoes what kind of what John says is it's got to be risk-based, but then some of the issue, like John pointed out, is what is the risk and how do you understand it? How do you quantify it? Because uh, some of that may not be shared. So the SPD-5 tries to get to that where it says via something like the Space ISAC, you potentially could share information so that these risks and, and, and knowledge get shared amongst the community. So, you know, SPD-5 does have a, a, some interesting uh, commentary. It, it really talks about uh, security in a couple of 
aspects, you know, uh, basically, you know, risk-based engineering using taking swap and mission context into it. But some of the principles they talk about is, you know, physical security, TTNC security for the, in the command link, jamming and spoofing protection, supply chain risk management, insider threat. So like those are some of the, the, the areas that it specifically points out, but then it essentially points to DHS CISA or, or not DHS CISA, but NIST, uh, NIST CSF cybersecurity framework guidance which is kind of standard across the community. And from a cyber perspective, it points to NIST, but there's still a translation that needs to occur. And that's what I point out in those slides that you had is there still needs to be a translation when you talk cybersecurity framework or risk management framework or uh, CISA guidelines. Like, what does that mean for a spacecraft? What does that mean for a ground system? What does that mean for Comlink? And that's one of the areas that aerospace uh, has focused on over the past year is trying to translate some of those things into actionable requirements and actionable security controls to help you know programs out figure out how to navigate this this process so i think spd5 is a great conversation starter it's really going to i think help you know people understand that there is an issue that needs addressed and this now it's just into the implementation side which i know the space isac and the national security council among others are working on implementation plans and things like that so it's exciting to see um, something like that put out and now we'll just wait to see what falls out from it Okay. All right. I am reading some of your comments, guys. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, uh, by the way, I should let you know, I'm streaming and looking at things on YouTube channel, both mine and the, and the Astronautical Society's channel. I'm looking at uh, Twitch and Facebook and Twitter. So uh, leave your comments and I'm getting them all. Uh, in fact, one of them is, uh, I want to go, I want to go into this from Frederick Rhodes. He is asking us to talk about the USA Space Force military. Um, and I don't know what these acronyms are, EM, AI, 5G, RFID, controlled space. Oh, I don't know what all that is. But I do want to, I do want, oh, RFID, radio frequency ID. I know what that is. And it, I don't know what uh, EM or maybe it means 5G. The, oh, okay. So maybe he's worried. <laughs> so let's talk about the Space Force <laughs> and its role in uh, protecting us from uh all of these cyber threats and uh, John you alluded to it a little bit last night but I would like to bring that up what what do you think first of all that we need a space force and second of all what would it because we have one what will its role be <laughs> well I, I, <laughs> I have a feeling I got I got a lot of people in here worried about 5g you know like with the uh, mind control thing so ignore that part but I, I do care about the space force part so uh, the space force is a very big deal uh, a lot of uh, energy is going into exactly what its role will be. So if you just started today with what the Space Force is, it is really uh, what was in the Air Force before. And those missions, the military missions that it performed were, were about, well, let's say 90% focused on the, um, the terrestrial fight. So how we support uh, all of the services in, uh, in, in a regular uh, war. And, and then, but its mission is to protect and defend and ensure freedom of access to, through, and in space. So, so that brings up really now the, 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 an expansion of its mission and what role uh, it will have in that regard. Now, even beyond that, there is some debate or, or discussion about its role in assuring commerce and and that sort of uh you know protecting commerce these are things that um, are going to take a long time to sort out and raise big questions about how can you do it um i i actually believe that if for those people who think that this is is simply a matter of having uh, military superiority and higher technology uh, i i don't think that's reasonable um uh, if you think about how hard it is to defend compared to how easy it is to destroy. Um, well, I'd put my money on, on destroying any day. So it, it cannot simply, you know, the approach for the Space Force simply can't be, um, you know, that the job will be on their shoulders, but this has to be a whole of government approach to building up a, a sort of a security and deterrence framework where the military and the Space Force is just one part of it. Um, now you, you mentioned cyber. Um, I, I do want to, spend just a moment talking about how the department is organized. There, there's a real 
difficult concept that people have. The Space Force does not fight wars. The Air Force does, and et cetera. These are organizational constructs that, that train people and, and buy equipment. The, where we fight wars, so to speak, is the, the combatant commands. And so um, U.S. Space Command will be responsible for for the issues in space. There is a cyber command that will, will be responsible for the cyber effects. Um, but, but you cannot pull cyber from space because so much of it is overlapping. So, so I think these issues are, are being worked out as far as where you draw the lines and how you complement each other. Um, so, so yeah, the Space Force has a mission to protect and defend um, or, or organize, train, and equip for that mission, for the U.S. Space Command to do that mission, uh, and so I, one of the things that I'm, I'm always interested in is, um, is how we're actually talking about where we're headed in this. We kind of say yes, we have to do it. There's not a lot of detail on how it will be achieved. You know, <laughs> and actually uh, assure freedom of access. So these are really interesting questions, big policy issues. Interesting, I, I think, implications for where we put investments in terms of technology and capabilities. Um, a lot of it, of course, will be classified, but I do think that the leadership uh, is trying to reduce the classification so that we can talk about it more. They, I guess one of the sort of bumper sticker statements is you cannot deter somebody if you, if you keep everything you can do secret. So it's got to somehow find a balance in there where the country and the world can start uh, you know, engaging in, in, in what the future looks like. So the Space Force is going to be right in the middle of it. U.S. Space Command will be right in the middle of it. U.S. Cyber Command uh, or, uh, will, will play a big role in the cyber aspect. So that's kind of where the, you know, the organizational structure is, is uh, um, focused on. Okay. All right. Uh, do you want to add anything to that, uh, uh, Brandon? No. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me go to uh, Juas Swan's question. Um, what about weapons in space? Does any country uh, have weapons in space? Does the U.S. plan that? Does the U.S. plan to have them? Okay, this might be one of those classified questions. But uh, do other are there any weapons in space? We have the space treaty, which was made up, I guess, in nineteen uh, the ancient times, nineteen fifties, I guess, or maybe the sixties. Uh, and everybody ratified it, promising to do only good things. Um, well, let's talk about what was promised, and this is important. Um, we have, there's a couple things that, that we signed up to. Um, one is that we would put output weapons of mass destruction in space. And so, of course, we, we do not do that. And I think there's another part that has to do with uh, doing something on celestial bodies. So um, short of that, there's a whole lot you can do. Now, some people will say that everything in space can be a weapon. You can take control of a of anybody selling, ram it into another. And, and so you get into a very difficult um, conversation of, uh, about how do you actually get to, you know, some final future objective when th these definitions are not clear. Um, so if, if we all would like to have a nice, secure, stable uh, environment, that's, that's a great vision, but, but the, the path to get there is very difficult. So I, I believe that, um, well, I know that General Raymond, who is, uh, well, at the time was the commander of U.S. Space Command, uh, publicly acknowledged that um, China had uh, launched a satellite that had uh, exhibited some, some very questionable behavior where it, it uh, sort of uh, um, something came out of another one and a projectile was, was shot from one. So, so I would suggest that while China was saying that was some sort of technology or experimental thing, that gives rise to a question of, you know, that, that looks an awful lot like a weapon. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's other behaviors. Russia was called out for uh, following uh, some of our what we call high-value assets uh, and, and, and kind of lurking around them. Um, that's another kind of behavior. It doesn't mean that that was a weapon system, but... But it's, it's the behaviors and the capabilities that together are causing a lot of concern for us. And there are not any norms of behavior yet. Uh, so you know, as, insofar as, um, you know, where, where we're going with all of this, uh, that, is a, that is, you know, uncharted right now. Okay. So, 
Oh, go ahead, Brandon. One quick, quick thing. So, um, and I can send these links. So I'll just, instead of trying to toe the line of what may be uh, protected and not protected, uh, NASIC, as well as DIA in the last year, put out two reports unclassified that talk about this kind of exact thing, these counter space um, weapons and, and um, you know, direct energy, electronic warfare, ASAT technologies. So if, if you can just Google NASIC competing in space, you'll find it. If you Google DIA uh, security in space, you'll find it. Those are the top links and that are coming to your Google and I can send the links um, to, to okay. after the fact. But those are two good resources to answer that kind of exact question on like what's R Russia and China's capabilities from an open source knowledge perspective. Cool. All right. Um, let me get to uh, uh, Ed Thompson from Twitter is, uh, or Twitch, sorry, is asking, most government agencies rely on IT security guidance from CISA. I don't know what that acronym is. CISA. CISA. Okay. Does NASA also get guidance from them as well? First of all, what is CISA? Yeah. And then does NASA get guidance from them too? So I, think I can take that one. So uh, what he's referring to is Department of Homeland Security, uh, CISA, and that let me see. I can't remember the, the name of exactly what CISA is. Let me look up real quick. Is um, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So what they, they do put out guidance and they do oversight and governance over, uh, over various uh, agencies. But from an IT security guidance perspective, actually the guidance comes from NIST. So it doesn't come from CISA. Uh, DHS CISA provides some governance, oversight, assessments and things like that. And they'll issue advisories on various topics. But the actual security control guidance comes from NIST. So from a NASA perspective, I, I worked there for 10 years. So uh, they, they derive their security guidance from the NIST 800-53 framework, as well as FISMA and FIPS, if you're familiar with those terminologies. And uh, the FISMA FIPS guidance is kind of government wide and that gets distributed down to various components. Uh, in the DOD, they have what's called CNSI 1253, which is kind of like NIST 800-53. I know these are like word bingo or whatever, but um, if you kind of Google those, you'll get it. So NASA does derive theirs from NIST and they do depend on CISA to provide some oversight guidance and some sort of like assessment capabilities for them. Okay, cool. And then he then and then he posts this comment. Well, it really everybody relies on CISA, so scratch that. <laughs> but that was good. Point out, though, something to point out though is the commercial sector doesn't really adhere to those same type of governance structures through NIST, CISA, and things like that, per se. I mean, if you're critical infrastructure, you may, uh, but, you know, SpaceX, for instance, they're, they don't have to adhere to the NIST 800-53 framework or, or CISA. So that's kind of the interesting paradox we're going to be in soon is these commercial companies, now when they contract with the government, they may have these requirements levied, but as a commercial entity, they may not have those same level of requirements and restrictions. Okay. All right. And finally, let me get to one of these. Uh, I actually know the answer to this, Frederick Rhodes. Uh, he's asking this from uh, from uh, uh, YouTube. He goes, is there a Hippocratic Oath for AI programmers? And I, I don't think so. Not right yet. <laughs> Do you guys know if there is? <laughs> for AI programming. Do no harm, I suppose, would be the hope. But um, <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. So, um, so Brandon, in your... Uh, Slides that I have. Um, one of them was I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and bring that up here. Let me see if I can get it. Um, let's see. Yeah, here it is. Uh, no wait, no, that's not it. Uh, just a sec. There we go. Right, right there. Yeah, you talk about um, one of the things that um, I'm interested in is. How do you protect yourself? I'm going to go ahead and make this big uh, so people can see it. Oh, oh, there we go. So you have a list here of some high-level requirements. This is in the context of how to protect ourselves. You've also put in this is slide number eleven on your on your thing here, and these high-level requirements uh, include things like. Um, it should be resilient against, you know, any space vehicle should be resilient against communications and position jamming attempts. And this list is quite extensive. But one of the ones that I am, I like to ask you about is the mission shall protect against supply chain threats uh, to the space vehicle by employing security safeguards. And then 
And then related to that, I think, is the one right below it, which talks about establishing robust procedures and technical methods to prevent the introduction of tainted ASIC and F, uh, FPGAs into the S, into the spacecraft supply chain. Now, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about that. When we want to build a space a spacecraft, we do it by getting parts and these parts have been space qualified and they you know all the the ground systems and all of the technology that we use have been tested rigorously is there a way with our supply chains doesn't that limit what we can and can't do because we can't just get things for example i'm just using china here um we might not want to get their electronics or their asics um or their uh you know floating point gatorades or whatever it is we buy uh, from just anybody, right? We want to make sure that who gives them to us doesn't have embedded within it some kind of strange code or, or a capability within it, right? So are we are we thinking about, you know, is, is that already being implemented or are we still vulnerable to that kind of requirement? So what, what you're stating is more of probably traditionally true and the, I guess the new, new way of doing things and the outsourcing of, of various things, these supply chains are no longer closed, which has opened up this attack vector from our perspective. So it, it used to be your, your supply chains were extremely tight and controlled and closed from an ASIC FPGA perspective from, cause you would have you know, certified, um, you know, trusted foundries and, and things like that for, to produce silicon and, and all the aspects of, of your, of your FPGA, you know, burning in your your logic. That's not always true anymore, uh, and it gets even worse when you get into the commercialization of space. Because I mean, for instance, like uh, commercial companies like SpaceX, they're they're they, they're using you know less uh, vetted parts than maybe what the government traditionally would. So the supply chain issue is going to get worse, I think, as we get in the small sat cube sat arena. You're pulling cots boards off the shelf, doing things a little bit uh, less, um, you know, less secure and less thought through than you were before. So um, I think, you know, 20 years ago, yeah, your supply chains were a lot more closed and today, today than they, than they really are. I think it's hit or miss on which programs you use more or agencies use more closed supply chains, but I think it's the vector is, has expanded quite extensively over the last 10 years. Yeah. I don't know how, I mean, I could just imagine, I, I always come back to the Hubble Space Telescope because it's one of my absolute favorite things ever. And of course, it's been up for 30 years. It's got technology on it that's very old. And getting to the spacecraft is obviously very hard. Uh, but I worry about, you know, but, but what if, I mean, this is just a thought experiment. What if in the last servicing mission back in 2009, that we put a board in there because we replaced just about everything on the, on the spacecraft. We put a board in there that had a chip in it that could be activated somehow by a series of commands that would cause it to, you know, point to the sun or something like that, right? And you really got to think about that stuff now, I think, way more than you ever did in the past yeah. because these, because space is such a harsh environment already inherently, your margin for error is already so tight that any malicious actor can do a lot of damage without a whole lot of, Effect. I mean, by effect with a uh, e, right? You can tweak tiny little things and then really destroy all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. And exactly. so, and that's why, my opinion, the software supply chain is the big one of the biggest attack vectors because, yeah, getting getting that uh, that you know, control gate or that you know hardware chip embedded in the supply chain is a lot harder than somehow gaining access to an insider or getting access to a code repository that's not necessarily as protected as you would expect it to be and getting a software-based Trojan, you know, a time bomb or something like that in, in, in there. So the supply chain on the software side to me is hugely uh, needs scrutinized and, and the way we use open source software these days and pull things off the shelf and have subcontractors upon subcontractors upon subcontractors doing things, it's very difficult, I think, to trace that down and there needs to be a lot more scrutiny in the software supply chain specifically. Yeah. I don't think you're just going to be connecting to GitHub or something like that to uh, do your software updates, but uh, you mean, and, and you just, I want to drill down a little bit on what you just said, because you, you, 
the spacecraft themselves are going to get hard. You're not going to get up there and put a new, uh, uh, you know, uh, ROM chip or something in there that would cause some stuff. But you could get in, uh, presumably, uh, to the uh, software update procedure somehow that uh, could totally damage all kinds of stuff. Um, you, since you said you work primarily in the ground systems, is that the weakest link in this chain? It are the ground, the ground-based systems? Now, you in your slides you have this tier system where you talk about tiers one through I think six or seven, <laughs> and one of the tiers I thought was really funny. Uh, funny only because of the, of the term you used. Let me see if I can bring it up real quick. It was. Um, uh, uh, what was it? it was um be slide 15. yeah it'd be slide 15 here it is uh tier one was script kitties <laughs> that made me laugh um uh so you know the the these are different kinds of attackers that you are um presumably protecting or, or thinking about and so i was just wondering um is this the weakest link some of these some of these uh uh the ground-based stuff, not so much the spacecraft. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's reflected in the in the graphic, right? So that your tier one adversary could be a script kitty that could even get in uh, from the ground systems that that communicate with the vehicle. So I mean, there's been breach after breach after breach of various ground ground stations and ground systems that that support uh, that you know communicate to spacecraft. You know, you can just read. Uh, I think I even have some in the backup of this, these charts. Um, you know, there's a good report by the London Cybersecurity Group that documents a bunch of different attacks. So, and this is backed by you know lots of research and, and events that the you know getting into the ground is easier. And now this is um, you know this depends on mitigating controls. You know, national security systems. You know, the uh, Department of Defense ground stations are obviously probably a little more secure than a university running a CubeSat. So this is this is this graphic and, and discussion is trying to be all encompassing of kind of space in general and not, you know, taking into account, you know, all the mitigating controls that may be in place from a physical screen perspective, a security clearance perspective, access and all those things. Uh, but script kitties could run because uh, the ground systems run standard IT equipment, you know, for the most part, they're running Windows Linux. So you can pull exploits off GitHub or Metasploit and attack some of these ground systems because sometimes they're not updated. They're a little you know, a little on the older side because they don't want to risk breaking the communication link to the, to the spacecraft. So uh, you can get in these systems, just like the industrial control system, operational technology arena, you know, those, those don't get updated. And those are very old at times because they don't want to, you know, break the, you know, break those either. So, so I think the ground is uh, the weakest link. That's, that's probably why it's been the most focus over the last 10, 15 years on security. That's why you see most of the security applied to the ground system outside of the comms link, you know, on the, some, most people are doing cryptography and, and transec on the, on the comms link, but the ground system is where all the focus has been traditionally in the government sector. And I think that's been a deficiency. And that's what I pointed out in these slides. It's like we, and you had in the intro is, is the spacecraft has really been avoided in discussion from a attack vector and from, there's a bunch of different, you know, vulnerabilities and things that can, can manifest itself on the spacecraft itself that we need to look into. But your tier one adversary can definitely go after the ground station from my from my perspective. Right, and that would just be somebody who wants to try and see if they can do it. And you have different uh, attacker uh, tiers here, but I want to ask you: uh, you've got you know hackers for hire. These are people that would you know that are uh, do this for a living. There's uh, small hacker teams uh, that just I guess just do this. You get together and do it, but they're not associated with state actors. But what's the difference between? Um, tiers five and six, where you've got highly capable state actors, presumably working for another government, uh, and a most capable state actor. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, so it seem to be one. Yeah, not in this. So this was uh, put together based on a generic threat model, based on those seven uh, capabilities below. So the ability to access networks, defeat cryptography, gain physical access. So from tier five to six. On that scale of seven uh, capabilities, there is not a difference in this threat model. But so the the threat model can be different. Like you could expand the capability into you know fifteen or twenty different capabilities, and that's where you'd see a little bit of a deviation between you know tier five and six. But for the purposes of this presentation and the and the research that I was doing as a part of this, 
there wasn't a difference in any of these seven capabilities of tier five and six. Um, you know, it's basically the the two big ones, Russia and China, obviously would be in that area based on just open source doctrine that's out there. So, um, and, you know, right in these different areas. So there's not, there's not really a difference in that using those capabilities as an evaluation criteria. Okay. All right. Well, um, here's a good question from, um, Jim Volk. Let me put this up. Brandon, your websites, your website states that you just opened an RD, R and D facility in this field. Can you tell more about it? Um, I'm trying to think where he's referring to as an R and D facility in this field, but Aerospace in general has been kind of trying to push the envelope based on our you know, customer needs, honestly, and cybersecurity for space systems. So I know we, we recently expanded capabilities in New Mexico and Albuquerque. So that may be what he's, what he's referring to, but you know, we have sites uh, all over the country in you know, strategic places, East coast, West coast, uh, Southwest, and things like that. So I'm not specifically knowing what facility he's referring to, but in general, uh, from a cybersecurity perspective for space, ground, cryptography, spacecraft, we have expanded our you know uh, footprint physically and with the people um, over the past year and continue to do so. Okay, well, neur uh, let's see, neuro one, neural net with a one, I guess I'll just, a neural net. Um, he's commenting, state actors, state actor teams are often not as capable because they can't smoke weed. Are you sure about that? Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> All right. Ed Thompson on Twitch is also commenting. Yep. If you want to have an idea how scary the lack of security is, go to a CEH course or watch the uh, Black Hat, um, yes. the Black Hat stuff that they do. So yeah. Uh, uh, so the Black Hat. Yes. Yeah. Since they mentioned Black Hat, that's that's interesting. So if if you, this is something that I've been talking about more recently is is there an interest in space and cybersecurity and it, and it's just ever apparent, you know, the black hat and DEF CON. So if you look at this year, there was a presentation by an individual, uh, to be able to intercept uh, communication from, from satellites and be able to pull all kinds of PII and inf inf interesting information, uh, based on unencrypted satellite communication links for internet providers. And then in DEF CON, that's where AFRL had the Hackasat event. They had a competition. Fifty thousand dollars to the winning team to be able to, if they could achieve the most challenges from a CTF perspective, trying to hack it into a satellite. Okay. So the community, the community is expanding rapidly, and you know the aerospace village at DefCon is getting more popular. So I foresee this being a growth area for sure. Okay. Uh, this one, uh, Jim Volpe is is uh, expanding on his recent or his earlier comment. He's about your R and D facility. He goes, the aerospace corporations recently announced. Second oh, yeah. state-of-the-art R&D facility in Colorado Springs uh, will be the focal point for delivering technical ex expertise across the space enterprise. That's the one he's talking about. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Sorry. Um, we're 4,000 some odd people company. I can't keep track of everything that kind of goes on. <laughs> well, it's just not, not something you do, right? So um, I want to uh, I want to get to Jim's comment. Jim loves to ask this question. I'm going to Jim Way from the AAS. He loves this question. So a uh, question from near the end. Um, what is keeping the both of you up at night? John, let's start with you. What keeps you up at night about this? I, I, well, I guess um, let's imagine the, the, the future. It, it, can, it, it can be uh, filled with threats or, 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 or more peaceful. And how do we get there? Um, I, I believe that the only way that we can help really shape that is to engage the world uh, in cross-domain policy issues. Um, we have to we have to tie activities that countries are willing to pursue today in terms of uh, economic uh, and and financial um, kind of policies. Uh, it, it, it cannot we can manage the future of space effectively without a whole of government approach and quite frankly an international approach this is this is just absolutely not something that the u.s can manage on its own um and quite frankly i don't see a lot of a lot to point to that we have achieved as a government so 
and we've established the National Space Council. We've always had the National Security Council. Um, and they have been very busy on things like the Space Force and, and other things. But, but I believe that, that that's the big problem that I believe that we have to get serious about. Uh, it's going to take a lot of leadership. There's some really hard, uh, difficult issues to work through. Um, you know, there are some countries that, that want to make agreements that sound good, but quite frankly, I think the real leadership puts questions to the, you know, to the, the proposals as how do you actually effectively verify them? And, and then what are the consequences of violations and things like that? Because in space, you can go from, you know, zero to, to one instantly. Um, the, the, there's in, you know, in, in, in most wars, we look for the escalation ladder, opportunities to, you know, settle things or, or bring things back off track. Um, I can imagine in space, things might even be incentivized to actually surprise you by going, you know, from peace to, to really bring down all of the systems as, as fast as you can. Um, so I, I think that that is a very big challenge for the world. And, and I don't see U.S. leadership um, on the field right now. And so countries are developing capabilities kind of, uh, you know, as long as they're not weapons of mass destruction that would violate uh, a real treaty, um, there's really, there's no mechanism to, to manage this. So I think, um, you know, this is one of the topics I, I joined uh, the Prague Security Studies Institute on. They're very active in uh, doing research and advocacy for uh, a number of security matters, uh, mostly in the economic and financial and space domains. And they, you know, they point to the, you know, as we talk about competition, global competition with Russia and China, um, this is not about competition in some far off um, war that might or might not be fought. It is competition that is happening today. Um, the, the countries are actually developing partnerships and policies to, to strengthen their positions. And, and I just don't see that we as a country or as a, as a you know, Western society are, are working it very hard. And, and I, with all due respect to the, you know, the, the policy groups that sit down and talk about norms of behavior, I mean, these are very, very small steps that, that are not yet really on a path that, that will lead to what I think is a, a, a secure, stable environment, which I think everybody uh, – hopes to, to achieve in, in the future. So that's kind of the big thing that I think um, we have to keep our eye on and, and, and actually start getting serious about it. Wow. Okay. Uh, Brenda, do you, any, you want to add something to that? What, what yeah. keeps you up at night? So on a, maybe a more granular level, I agree with John. I mean, that what he said is accurate. So one of the things that kind of keeps me up in this, in this is space, uh, at least in the federal side and the government side is filled with kind of, you know, old school people or people have been in this industry for quite some quite some time, which is pretty standard. But the lack of a catastrophic cyber event you know, hap happening in space, uh, the lack of that ha happening, which thank God it hasn't happened. You know, it, it's hard to get people to move. We're a very reactionary group um, by nature. You know, it's it's like, oh, there, there hasn't been something terrible happened. So why should we change what we've always done type of thing? And and yeah, waiting. Anybody who's worried about climate change knows that. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till <laughs> catastrophic happens before we take action. Now we're seeing the tide change a little bit, right? SPD five people talking things, but that, that, that's going to take years to get down to the implementation level where engineers are changing the design of the spacecraft or they're changing design of certain things. So uh, hopefully we don't take that event. I mean, I use this parallel all the time and in the industrial control systems, operational technology arena. It wasn't until uh, things like Stuxnet where you have things, you know, explode and blow up or you have loss of life in other countries or you have the Russian government cutting the power um, to one of their adversaries. Those type of things affect change. And I, I don't want to see one of those have to happen in space before we really start to start to make, you know, a, an effort, you know, at the, at the low level, at the engineering level. I, John was, perfectly right with the policy, getting the government, all this stuff in line is definitely necessary, but engineers are hard to, hard to move, you know, uh, and usually they move when something bad happens and I don't want it that to happen. Hopefully people can hear these talks and hear these things and figure out, okay, we need to maybe make some concessions and move on. 
to a more secure environment. Yeah, but engineers also move when you give them a good problem to solve. And I think part of the reason this SPD5 thing uh, is good is it helps to find the problem, right? So, I mean, I don't know. It's I, I, I hope we're not as hamstrung as a, as a nation as you guys are making it. I hope we can do we can get to this quicker uh, than it sounds like we're going to get to, um, because I don't think other countries are going to be as hamstrung as us, right? So uh, it's it's um, it's something I hope does get addressed pretty quickly. Um, let me just pull up. Um, by the way, Jim, that is a cool question. I like it too. <laughs> uh, Jim Volpe wants to know: SPD five is not totally clear on no encryption, no fly rule. Will this be enforced by the U.S.? And if so, how and where? And if not, uh, why not? So on this on this note, so SPD five does basically it, it. Well, it doesn't do anything by enforcement, right? It just provides guidance, right? So and directive. So there is encryption and authentication mentioned in there on the command link. So that that's supported by there. You know, there's this, in the Department of Defense, we, there's basically been this rule forever, right? No, no encryption, no fly. And then on the NASA side, there's the, they just released a standard called NASA Standard 1006 in November 2019 that requires encryption moving forward. So um, that NASA will be essentially a no encryption, no fly rule. I think, I think the Department of Defense has already been there for years. I'm not sure where some of the other sectors, NOAA and others may, may go. But I think it's I think it's getting there. For sure, John. What What do you think um, from that from your perspective? Well, I, I think you're right. This this uh, SPD five is really not directive. The the word sort of the the word they use throughout it is should. should. People should do this. It, it, it there's not a requirement. Again, I believe this is a a beginning step in a very difficult, very long term problem. That, that I think it, it was as good of a step as you can take. Uh, I, I, I mean, let's face it, um, forcing somebody to put encryption on some of these architectures where they're flying hundreds or thousands will really change the cost calculus and make it much more difficult to close a business case. I, I think some of these uh, things that people are trying to do are, are uh, risky on their own right now. So adding a lot of requirements could just kill them. So I, I think this is a, a very delicate balance that we're in for. And uh, again, it's going to be a long-term um, process to figure out how the government can be supportive and how it can it can really overall help manage um, the space domain to be a, a safe uh, environment for, for everybody. Yeah. Um, and there was a follow-up um, comment here that I wanted to find. I'm looking through it now. Uh, this is from Ed Thompson. Yep. It, oh, I already read that one. Sorry. Um, uh, so I've lost that. Oh, here it is. Neural nets. <laughs> I like this one. This is from Twitch. Uh, script kiddies have shown to be the most capable hackers in the past. I know. I just like the term, right? I love the term. Uh, these are, you know, it's it's very descriptive and you can kind of immediately see exactly who they're talking about here. So, um, but yeah, I'm not saying they're not capable. They, and according to this, uh, let's see if I still have it up. Yeah, I do. Uh, according to this slide here, um, the, uh, the, they really only are going to be able to get in, I think, let me pull this up, uh, through, yeah, through the ground side. So, um, yeah, if we, uh, uh, where'd it go? I'm trying to, my, there it goes. So here's where tier one through four can get in a malicious cyber actor. They can generally get in uh, somewhere through the authorized ground station somehow. Right. Um, what about things just like regular old uh, phishing emails, stuff like that? What, does that work here? Or are these ground stations designed in such a way that really you can't like bring in, you know, some kind of strength, you know, use your own personal email or use Gmail or something like that? How are they set up generally? And how many do we have? Are there a lot of ground stations? Um, I don't think there's a lot that does space communication. Is there? Well, so it's a, it's a conflation of terms a little bit. So the, the term oh, maybe okay. ground station would be an antenna, right? That, that's the typical terminology that people could equate. And there's probably hundreds. Oh. That's the antenna itself that does the communications. The ground system is another term that's kind of used where those are the, the command and control workstations and servers that actually issue the commands that get modulated to the, to the vehicles. 
So the ground systems where, you know, the traditional IT, you know, your Windows, your Red Hat, your CentOS, Sun OS <laughs> uh, boxes are, are running. Um, that's where you could have, you know, the, the script kitty type attacks get in. Sun? Did you say Sun OS? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Still well, going, would, still going yeah. through Sun, Sun Solaris 7. Just, I, I've seen it recently. Oh, my God. <laughs> I remember those. I worked on Spark 20s, too. And, uh, of course, they upgraded. They upgraded the Sun OS. I forgot what came. Now you got me thinking about Suns now. Sorry, I better, I better stop. Um, okay, so um, let me get quickly to Jim Volpe's uh, comment. Small satellites that have propulsion systems but don't have encrypted commanding systems pose a small but real threat to being hacked and endanger and endangering other satellites, according to a new study. So yeah. small satellites that um, don't have encrypted commanding systems are pretty vulnerable. What do you guys say to that? I agree. The uh, it's basically a projectile in space that has maneuverability. So, in lieu of you launching your own device to create space debris or some projectile or some ASAT, if you can hijack an existing small sat and command it to move into the orbit of an of something you want to take take out, that's where space situational awareness and space debris knowledge is is, is key. But you know, th those got to be kind of real time space awareness to to be able to navigate some of those threats of an actual satellite moving it intentionally moving into your orbit, you know, as you're going by, um, yeah. I think it's a real threat. And that's why the contestedness of, and then the, and the barrier to entry is all part of this whole issue. That's going to be very difficult to maneuver. I think in the future, I wonder how much SpaceX is thinking about this with Starlink because they're, we're talking, what are they, what, what is the final number going to be? It's tens of thousands of satellites up there. Um, I wonder if they're thinking about this. I mean, you know, this this encryption and the, the way in which things are communicated. One of the things that it's going to need more than anything is high bandwidth. So encryption communication, encrypted communication would be very, I think, computationally expensive and, and slower than if you uh, didn't if you didn't have it. But I wonder if they're thinking about it. I know you guys probably don't know what their design situation is, but um do private, I mean, private corporations must have to think about this stuff now with Starlink and and um, the other systems that are coming online from like Amazon and, and OneWeb and all those people. Yeah, I, I guess as a response to that, I would just say, you know, don't don't get too focused on one problem and and, and plugging one hole. I think SPD five uh, did <laughs> talking about everything from the early design phase all the way through operations, and it's all important. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's this is not. A, a little fix to, oh, just add encryption. This is a, a, a very complicated uh, set of problems that will evolve um, over time. Yeah, that, that, that's why the, you know, that's why I said the main takeaway, in my opinion, of SPD-5 was I call it a threat-informed risk-based engineering approach is because if you, if you caveat that way, the threats will evolve uh, over time and you can respond to them accordingly. If you have the policy and the procedures to support threats as the input, the engineering output will be a more secure system. Okay. Well, I think I'll leave this. Uh, we're out of time, everybody. I want to uh, want to thank you guys for joining us. I'm going to leave this with Peter Quinn, uh, the mighty Quinn, he calls himself now. Uh, I know the film War Games. Perhaps that should have a remake, Deep Astronomy. Yes, maybe it's time for a remake of War Games. But come on, man. That was an awesome movie, and you're not going to do a much better job than what they did back in the 1980s. I, rem I mean... Come on, that was really good. All right, so I'll leave it there. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. On behalf of my guests, uh, my guests today were uh, John Stouffer. He's a senior fellow at the Prague Security Studies Institute. Also, Brandon Bailey is the cybersecurity senior project leader at the Aerospace Corporation. Thank, thank you both for taking time out to talk to us today about what you're doing and protecting us in space. Thanks, Tony, and thanks to uh, the uh, society. All right, and yes, okay. And on that note, I will also thank the American Astronautical Society for make, bringing this to us. Thank you very much. Don't forget to go to astronautical.org slash members or slash join and check out, remember, the Von Braun Symposium's coming up next month. It's always got a lot of good information in it, so please uh, consider registering for that as well. It's going to be virtual. You've got no travel expenses. You may as well do it. So um, so check it out. It'll be a, It's a lot of fun, a lot of good information there. So um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, keep looking up.